to wait and see because it's not entirely clear what strategies are going to be mm -hmm. pursued. Our partners in the GCC particularly felt that, um, that the Obama administration was tilting towards Iran. The Trump administration with its budget proposals uh, is really building a one-legged stool. Hi, I'm Paul Salem from the Middle East Institute and this is Vantage Point. And I have the pleasure today to have a conversation with my colleague, Ambassador Jerry Feierstein. Ambassador Feierstein is currently a senior fellow and the director of the program on Gulf Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Uh, but he's had a very long and illustrious career in the Foreign Service. Too long. Uh, too long, you would say, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, 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 including uh, postings in uh, uh, over nine overseas postings, uh, many in the Middle East, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, in Lebanon, uh, in Jerusalem, and in Tunisia. Uh, he was also, uh, from 2010, the ambassador to Yemen at the time of the beginning of the Arab Spring in Yemen and uh, the negotiations uh, that ensued there. And after uh, leaving Yemen in 2013, he served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. So he knows all things Middle East, and uh, we're here to talk to him about some of them. Uh, let me start with uh, President Trump's visit to, uh, to the Middle East, uh, or what he calls the Middle East, which is largely the, uh, the Arab part, uh, where he met in Riyadh with the GCC countries, but also leaders of uh, many Muslim countries. Uh, is this, how do you read this, you know, uh, uh, initiative? Is it a shift in U.S. policy? Uh, how would you describe what it puts in place? Well, I think that, uh, that the medium is the message, uh, that uh, in fact his, uh, his meeting, his willingness to sit down with the Arab leaders as well as the GCC and the Saudis was a, a signal that, uh, that he's shifting uh, that a lot of the uh, very harsh campaign rhetoric is behind him, and that he uh, now recognizes that in order to move forward and achieve some of the objectives he laid out in the campaign, uh, he really needs to uh, have the support and the cooperation of the broader Middle East and Islamic worlds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that the, uh, that the visit was uh, very strong on the atmospherics. Mm -hmm. uh, his speech was well received. Many of the things that he uh, talked about uh, during the visit uh, were, uh, were uh, popular with uh, the leaders. They had a sympathetic audience. I think that they appreciated what they heard from him in terms mm -hmm. of uh, his vision for U.S. policy in the region. Uh, but uh, I would still say that uh, how you translate that broad kind of rhetorical vision statement down into real tangible policies, things that are implementable and measurable, uh, still uh, leaves an awful lot that's very uh, unclear in terms of the direction that the president intends to mm -hmm. go. Well, let's start with the atmospherics. I mean, obviously, it was mm -hmm. it was long on atmospherics mm -hmm. and dancing and you mm -hmm. know page pageantry as and, it were uh, and glowing orbs and, and glowing <laughs> orbs and all the rest of it. Uh, and one question there is that uh, candidate Trump ran on atmospherics of being anti-Muslim in a mm -hmm. sense, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. appealing to that sort of anger and so on. And yet, it seems that now his best friends, in a way, in the world, I mean, given that you know, his visit to Europe wasn't high right. on atmospheric ceremony. Right. Uh, how do you, I mean, do you actually see a difference in substance there at that level? We'll leave the issues of arms deals and you know, other things to the, you know, in a moment. But on atmospherics, mm -hmm. is it significant? Well, I, I, think it, I think it is significant. I think that, that again, it, it demonstrates uh, recognition on the part of this administration that, uh, that they need the support, they need the cooperation uh, of the Arab and Islamic worlds if they're going to uh, succeed in challenging Iranian ambitions in the region, if they're going to succeed in turning back uh, violent extremism, uh, doing those things, they're not going to get there without the support. So, um, so he set aside some of the rhetoric, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and also, uh, of course, he said some other things that for the uh, leaders who were assembled, 
uh, were, uh, were very well received, including his, uh, his identification that the United States is going to be guided by its interests, uh, that uh, he is not going to pursue uh, uh, some of the very strong uh, uh, positions that the Obama administration took on issues like civil liberties, human rights. Uh, he's not going to lecture, he said. Uh, and uh, these are things that for, uh, for that particular group are the kinds of things that they wanted to hear. So, so he's, he's uh, uh, adopted a very pragmatic position uh, towards the region, towards uh, being able to work. And of course, even beyond uh, the issue of Iran, uh, on, on issues like the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, recognizing again that having the support and the cooperation of this particular group is going to be important for mm. him. Well, let's look. I mean, one big element of the deal was the money, of course. Mm -hmm. And maybe the president, President Trump, maybe that's a big you know, issue for him. He promised mm -hmm. as a candidate to bring jobs back mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. improve trade relations. Mm -hmm. He complained, maybe like President Obama, to complain that partners and allies were freeloading on the U.S. And so, right. so he got a big arms deal or signed a number of arms deals that maybe were in the making and supposedly other commitments for investments in the, in the U.S. Could you sort of break that down a little, particularly on the military side? Is this new? Is this a new level of, of the relationship or just more of the same? Well, I think, I think it is uh, uh, pretty, pretty consistent. And don't forget that uh, that the uh, U.S. has been Saudi Arabia's major security partner for decades, uh, really since the end of the Second World War. And, uh, and the Saudis have generally turned to the United States to provide uh, for the, uh, the weapon systems, the, the security that they require for their own, uh, for their own needs. Uh, and so the things that were being talked about uh, in this $110 billion package really were things that uh, actually have been in the works for some time. Mm -hmm. The precision-guided munitions, as you'll recall, uh, were actually first discussed with the Obama administration. Uh, the Obama administration decided to hold back from that sale because of their concern about the air campaign inside of Yemen. Uh, we've been anticipating that the Trump administration would uh, decide to proceed with that really mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. January. And, uh, and so it's no surprise that they're going to do that. The but it still has to pass a hurdle in Congress. It, it does. Yeah. Uh, my understanding from what I hear on the Hill is that while there will be opposition and there will be some, uh, uh, some uh, efforts to uh, block it, uh, it's unlikely that those will succeed. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost certain mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, that sale will go through. Even on the others, the, um, the, the THAAD system, uh, the uh, high altitude air defense system that was announced, uh, is something that uh, the Obama administration was pressing uh, our partners in the Gulf to do uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a guard against uh, Iran's bl uh, ballistic missile uh, programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, uh, and the naval ships are, are to improve coastal defenses for the Saudis. So mm -hmm. these are all things kind of the package. that are very, the pipeline and very the, consistent yeah. with the kinds of cooperation mm -hmm. and the kinds of weapon sales that we've made in the past. $110 billion is a big price tag. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, so the question would be, uh, whether or not Saudi Arabia can really afford at this juncture uh, with oil prices stuck in that uh, $40, $50 range, mm -hmm. uh, whether they can afford to go forward with a package like that uh, when they're trying to diversify their economy and do a lot of things on the domestic uh, side. But, uh, but the, the systems themselves are very consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other two sort of uh, maybe security goals of the meetings there, one was counterterrorism, right. and the other was containing or confronting Iran, and President right. Trump addressed both. Right. But what's your assessment in terms of, has anything changed in those two strategies? Uh, uh, maybe some, some have. How effective on these two lines? And maybe let's start with counterterrorism first. Well, on the counterterrorism side, I would say again that the, that the major theme would be continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the three elements uh, that, that he talked about, of course, the kinetic uh, effort to uh, defeat and destroy uh, ISIL mm -hmm. uh, and uh, violent extremism in the region, so Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and others. Uh, as well as the counterterrorism finance uh, piece and the counterterrorism messaging center. Mm -hmm. And of course, he inaugurated the center in Saudi Arabia. 
Uh, these are all very much things that we've been working on really since 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so we, we've taken it another step farther, uh, particularly on the counterterrorism finance, of course. I think that, uh, that the administration was pleased mm -hmm. that they got from the uh, leaders in the, in the larger Arab and Islamic uh, setting. Uh, commitment that they would not only uh, ensure that uh, governmentally they weren't supporting mm -hmm. uh, terror through uh, funding, but also that they would take steps to eliminate so, private funding. So in a way, it's a continuity, but it's intensification. Right, a, a, perhaps, new, yeah, uh, yeah. a new effort. We'll see, again, yeah. we'll see how it translates from the rhetoric into the reality, mm -hmm. what, uh, what steps they actually take. Yeah. But rhetorically, an important step uh, and a recognition of the danger of priority finance. of that and so on. On Iran, I mean, uh, obviously on a Iran, different approach than President Obama. Absolutely, and and of course, this goes to the heart of the uh, unhappiness in the region with the Obama administration mm -hmm. and the sense that the uh, that our partners in the GCC particularly felt that um, that the Obama administration was tilting towards Iran, uh, that it was pursuing a strategy of an opening with Iran that in some ways was going to come at their expense. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really was the heart of, the, uh, of their uh, unhappiness So and, what's and new, uh, I mean, other than the strong rhetoric against again, Iran, the, the nuclear deal is still right. there. What, what elements do you see being put in place that might be actually different? And, and here again, I, I think that, that we need to wait and see because it's not entirely clear what strategies are going to be mm -hmm. pursued. Is the administration going to support new non-nuclear sanctions against Iran? And what kind of support will they get if they do that? Of course, an awful lot uh, uh, is, uh, is tied up with the campaign in Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, which uh, we'll get to in a moment. Uh, which we'll get to yeah. in a moment. Uh, but the assertions that the uh, administration is going to be more forward-leaning in terms of supporting the Saudi-led coalition uh, with, the, uh, with the munition sales, but also perhaps uh, um, reviving uh, some of the, the agreements that we had, some of the initiatives that we had taken to share intelligence and to do some other things that would help improve uh, the performance of mm -hmm. the Saudi coalition to do more to help defend the Saudi-Yemeni uh, border. Mm -hmm. so, so there may be some, uh, some, uh, some leaning some there. Leaning there. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, where we go on, on the post-ISIS Syria, uh, and uh, some of the efforts that the Iranians are making to increase uh, their presence in, uh, in Syria, Iraq, into Lebanon, and, and how the administration may mm -hmm. anticipate pushing back on that. Uh, that, of course, being a threat not only to the Gulf states, but also to mm -hmm. Israel. Before getting to Yemen, let me ask about the Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. leg or mm -hmm. aspect of the visit to mm -hmm. Riyadh, and then the mm -hmm. visit, obviously, to Israel and the mm -hmm. Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, you know, every new U.S. president comes in vowing that, you know, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict will be high on their list. President Obama tried with George Mitchell. Other than, you know, talking about it and visiting, do you see any different elements, any new approach that might bear any fruit? Well, certainly the, um, the outside-in strategy that, uh, that the president talked about briefly in, uh, uh, during the visit of Bibi Netanyahu to, to Washington mm -hmm. early in the administration in February. Which is what, if you could explain oh, what so, outside So in outside in, in other words, would, would be an emphasis on getting support for the peace process from the broader Arab world, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the Gulf, uh, but also Egypt and Jordan and, and some of our other uh, longstanding partners mm -hmm. on the peace process. And the idea would be that by taking steps uh, early on in the process, uh, their, uh, their normalization or their positive movements uh, towards Israel would help improve the atmosphere for the negotiations and give the Israelis confidence that indeed there would be benefit for them mm -hmm. by making some of the hard choices that they're going to have sort to make. Sort of increase the pie, as it so, were. So yeah. it increases the pie, it, uh, it makes it more interesting, more valuable for the Israelis. Uh, and therefore, uh, hopefully, you, you get some forward momentum. Was there any give there? Was there any progress? I well, mean, that's I, a plan, but... I, I, yeah. I think, uh, uh, again, in a, in a broad sense, the, uh, the Arabs, and especially the Saudis, reiterated that, uh, that they would be ready and willing to move forward. 
Uh, but we are still in a position where, for the Arabs, it appears that primarily they want to see progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front first, mm -hmm. and then that they will respond positively to what they see as progress, as opposed to having them front load uh, some of the steps in order to promote the progress. So having said that, is there anything new or promising in this administration's effort? I think it's too early to make a final judgment about it, but uh, I would say at this juncture that what we've heard from the Arabs is pretty much a reiteration of where they've been really the for the last 25 years. Of, oh, yeah, even, even, before even before that, we yeah. had the Madrid Peace Conference in mm -hmm. 1991, uh, where they first floated the idea of normalization in exchange for an Israeli-Palestinian deal. That was codified and reissued as the Arab Peace Initiative mm -hmm. with King Abdullah in, in uh, 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, really seems to remain as the key pillar of where the uh, broader Arab mm -hmm. world is on supporting the peace process. Okay, thank you. Let's move to Yemen. I mean, okay. one of the obviously uh, large human suffering there, a lot of, uh, and, you know, doesn't seem to be much of an end in sight. Right. You served as ambassador there, you, you follow events closely. Where are we now in the Yemen conflict? And more importantly, where do you see potential for negotiation and some, some exit from this conflict? Right. Well, I, I think that, uh, of course, um, uh, Ismail Old Sheikh Ahmed, the, uh, the UN Special Envoy, continues to make his rounds. Uh, he uh, had a, uh, a difficult visit to Sana'a uh, last week where uh, not only did he not uh, have uh, an opportunity to sit down with either the Houthi or uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh leadership, uh, but also there were some uh, incidents involving his motorcade that were unsettling. Mm -hmm. So um, that seems to have been a little bit of a setback. Uh, but I think uh, my understanding is that he will return to the region again uh, in the next few weeks and continue his efforts to get the parties to go back to the negotiating table. Uh, the, uh, the, the fighting is generally stalemated. There mm -hmm. hasn't been much change in the nature of the, uh, of the military conflict for some time mm -hmm. now. Uh, we uh, were hopeful uh, that, uh, that there might be uh, an opening to make some progress on uh, reopening the port at Hodeida mm -hmm. uh, that would help address some of this humanitarian suffering that you mentioned earlier. Uh, we're still waiting, we're still hopeful that the parties will, uh, in fact, uh, be willing to, to make those concessions and, and at least address the humanitarian issue, mm -hmm. the, the famine. We've had some, uh, some additional uh, uh, complications with the outbreak of cholera in Sana'a, which has uh, taken the lives of several hundred people, uh, and some other uh, additional uh, additional um, uh, issues challenging the, the citizens mm -hmm. of, of Let Yemen. Let me ask here, how is the U.S. engaging diplomatically? I mean, you mentioned the U.N. envoy. Right. The U.S. is not terribly engaged diplomatically in the Syrian conflict, which is sort of proceeding without the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, does the U.S. have a, you know, a diplomatic energy in the Yemen crisis since maybe it can have some diplomatic uh, exits? Well, Ambassador Tour is still, um, is still on the ground mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Jeddah, mm -hmm. uh, still uh, meeting regularly with the Yemeni leadership as well as with the Saudis and the coalition, uh, and still uh, very much supporting the, uh, the UN process and, and trying to uh, engage and, mm -hmm. and get the, uh, the parties back to the negotiating table, whether it's in Kuwait or someplace else. He does have uh, an ability to communicate as well with the Houthis. Mm -hmm. so, so we are still, so, yes. yeah, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a very quiet way, uh, we're still mm -hmm. very much a, a part of the process. Well, let me ask, I mean, to what degree is the Yemeni conflict Yemeni? Well, obviously, Yemen has had many bouts of this in the past. And to what degree is it or has it become also a regional? conflict with Saudi Arabia and Iran, kind of another area where they're contesting. How would you sort of assess that? I would say that it's primarily uh, uh, an internal Yemeni conflict mm -hmm. uh, that goes back and, and is, uh, is being fought along many of the fracture lines in the uh, Yemeni political and social systems. Mm -hmm. So the, the fractures between uh, the Houthis and the, the Zaidi Shia and the Sunni population between the north and the south. And these are still primarily mm -hmm. uh, the lines along which this conflict is being, is being fought. 
Uh, the outside parties, uh, I think, were drawn in. Uh, the Iranians, because they saw this as an opportunity, in my view, mm -hmm. to, uh, to provoke and agitate the Saudis uh, and to uh, challenge uh, the Saudis on, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the Saudis more in a defensive uh, mode in, in terms of, of trying to ensure that there's a friendly government in Sana'a and that their border is secure between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Mm -hmm. so, so the outside parties, uh, although, um, although clearly each sees the other as an antagonist in this, uh, in this uh, operation, I would say are relatively minor players and that the, the, the solution to the conflict is going to come from an agreement amongst the Yemenis themselves. Mm -hmm. And was that almost reached uh, in the negotiations in Kuwait a few months ago? Uh, well, about a year ago. And, yeah. and so there was a lot of optimism uh, just about one year ago mm -hmm. uh, that uh, indeed the parties were ready to uh, come up with a formula that would allow them to go back to Sana'a, uh, that would allow the government to reestablish itself, and, uh, and that would begin to wind down the conflict. Uh, they, uh, the, the talks uh, went from April to August last year. I think that they started out with people being quite optimistic mm -hmm. uh, that, they would, uh, that they would reach an agreement, and unfortunately at the end they, they didn't because uh, it would appear that uh, on neither side was there the willingness to make the concessions, and perhaps on both sides there was still a, uh, a view that they might achieve their objectives through the military mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. The other problem that you have is that on both uh, the government side and on the Houthi Sala side, there are fractures within the coalitions. They're fragile. Uh, and uh, even again, uh, this issue with uh, Ismail uh, last week in Sana'a could very well be a reflection of internal differences within the Houthi movement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, between those who are more inclined to support a political solution and those who want to uh, mm -hmm. continue mm -hmm. the fight. Let me end with a broad question. You've had a long career in the State Department. Uh, the budget that the White House uh, has put forward includes massive cuts up to 30% to the State Department. It still has to go through Congress. That right. might be adjusted. And I know that you're very concerned about that, but in particular, mm -hmm. as relates to US diplomacy in the Middle East, where you've served in so many sensitive places, what do you see the real world implications of these cutbacks? Well, uh, uh, what, um, uh, what, what I have uh, concluded is that, uh, uh, that the Trump administration with its budget proposals uh, is really building a one-legged stool. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, particularly when you talk about uh, violent extremism and uh, the effort to stabilize the situation internally in many of these uh, countries, and uh, speaking uh, specifically about Yemen, but mm -hmm. not only Yemen, uh, that, that really um, U.S. engagement requires that we have a full strategy that includes not only uh, the, the military and kinetic effort to, uh, to challenge and defeat extremism, but also to help build societies. And we can't do that without a, uh, without a robust diplomatic engagement and a commitment to spending the, the, the time and the effort uh, that's necessary to allow these societies to build institutional capacity mm -hmm. that allows them to govern themselves, that allows them to address the, the requirements of their populations. Uh, but with the uh, Trump budget, we see an emphasis only on the military uh, and that the diplomatic and, uh, and assistance um, support are being cut way back. The, the bottom line is that you're not going to be able to succeed in any of these efforts uh, with that kind of, a, of an uneven approach. Mm -hmm. You have to have an equal effort on all of these uh, uh, points in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, fundamentally, particularly on the issue of extremism and stability, uh, the uh, Trump administration with its budget proposals is setting itself up to fail. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. This has been a Vantage Point from MEI with Ambassador Jerry Firestein, and thanks for being with us.